Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to have everybody with us again, and uh, I, I mentioned it in the first half hour, but uh, I think I'll have to uh, remind our listening audience again that we've got folks here from Indiana and Louisiana, <coughs> some over from Oklahoma City, and uh, let's see, we got a gentleman here from Memphis, so uh, we're, we're getting people from far and near. We got ladies from Claremore who haven't been with us before. So anyway, we always appreciate that uh, you make an effort to come in and be part of our studio audience. Again, we always like to remind our audience because every day, every day, people call, well, do you have books? Do you have videos? So we have to constantly remind, yes. All of our past programs from Genesis up to where we are now are available on the video, the audio, and the little printed book. And if you're interested in any of those little vehicles, why, uh, you give us a call or drop us a line. And again, I want to remind folks out in television that if you would like to get our newsletter, we put out quarterly, free, it won't cost you anything, and we don't make any appeals for money. In fact, again, just this last week, Ira sat down and wrote a nice, nasty letter <laughs> <laughs> to a group that she immediately responded with a gift last fall I guess it was and she's been keeping track and since she sent in her 20 25 bucks or whatever they have spent just about the whole thing on postage mailing back more appeals for money that's ridiculous I did this with a with a Christian ministry way way back and I just wrote and told them, take my name off your list because you spend every penny of what I give to just write back and fill my mailbox with more appeals for money. Uh, I won't take that route. Uh, I just refuse to do that. So if you have any doubts about getting on our mailing list, it never goes out of our own office. And uh, we do not use it as an appeal for money. We only use our newsletter for letting you know where we are, where we're going for uh, various seminars and a uh, few of the letters from our audience. And so if you're interested in that, you feel free to drop us a note and uh, we'll get that newsletter out to you quarterly for nothing. All right, now I think we're ready to get rolling. We're going to now take the other side of the coin. For the last two half hours, we've been looking at the Day of the Lord. The day of judgment, the wrath of God that's going to hit primarily the nation of Israel, but it's going to fall over and affect the whole human race. Because you want to remember, by the time those seven years have ended, with the exception of a small percentage of survivors, which we pick up in Isaiah 24, the whole six and a half billion of the population of this world are going to go. They're going to lose their life, one way or another. And I know that's devastating. But see, God has to cleanse the, the whole planet of everything that's contrary to him so that the curse can be lifted and he can bring in the kingdom of heaven on earth. And there will be nothing evil or wicked or that destroys in his kingdom. So this pleasant system has to be totally done away with. You know, every time we drive through the country and we see all this construction, you know, I think I've made this illusion before. I so often feel like a mound of ants. Now, in my younger days, I used to get a kick out of just tormenting those poor little creatures and plug the hole and destroy their mound. I don't do that anymore, don't worry. But uh, as a kid, you know, I got a kick out of that. But now, you see, when I go through the country and I see all this construction going on, and men just like these little ants, and one day God just going to wipe the whole thing clean, and all of their activity is going to be for nothing. Now, I know it has to be done now. I'm not saying that they shouldn't, because, my goodness, I had to tell somebody the other day, can you imagine the gridlock that this world would be in if we had this population and we had all this production and transportation and we were still on two-lane roads, boy, it would be awful. So the technology, fortunately, has kept up with everything. But nevertheless, it's all going to be wiped clean. The planet is going to be made totally new 
for the appearance of the king in his kingdom. All right, now, just for sake of, of Bible study, it's not so clearly delineated here in 1 Thessalonians as we see in the second letter, but I think it behooves us to now compare all these references to the day of judgment and the day of the Lord with the day of Christ or what we call the end of the church age, the body of Christ finishing its time on earth, and we're taken out. Now, isn't it amazing? The day of the Lord starts all the way back at Isaiah chapter 2, comes all the way up through the Old Testament, comes through the Gospels to a certain extent, skips over Paul's epistles, and picks up again in Peter and in Revelation. Now, on the other hand, every reference to the day of Christ will come only from Paul's epistles, and you can find no reference to it anywhere else in Scripture. Now, that should be enlightening. Well, you'd think that that would just blow away all the arguments. But, no, they continue to mix it all up, you know. They keep throwing it in the blender. They turn it up on high and then start leveling it out. And as I've said so many times before, and then they wonder why people get sick to their stomach. Well, it's enough to confuse anybody. But if you just keep it separated, keep Paul's epistles, the body of Christ, where it belongs, and everything else that just fits on the front end and on the back, then there's no problem. All right, so for the day of Christ, come back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and uh, Jerry still got verse 3 up there. This is what I want to point out first. In verse 3, Paul writes, when they... Now you say, so what? Well, go back up to chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians and look at the pronouns. All the way through where we were a few programs back. Verse 13, I would not have you, speaking to us believers, to be ignorant, that you sorrow not. Verse 14, for if we believe, that Jesus died and rose again. Verse 15, for this we say unto you, and then come all the way down to verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up in the air. So shall we, as the consortium of the body of Christ's believers, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now look at the change in pronouns. This in itself is so obvious if you just take the time to look. Now, instead of we and you, it's what? They and them. Well, why? Because we're not involved with this day of the Lord. They will be, but we won't. What am I talking about? Those that are left behind, as that famous list of books has been writing about. And why, I guess millions of people have been reading it. Everything in those, in those fictional books are in reference to the day of the Lord. We're not in that day of the Lord. We're up here, but once we've experienced the day of Christ and the rapture, then these people become what? They and them, not we and us. See the difference? Okay, now I'll come back to chapter 5 then, verse 3 again. So when they, those who have been left behind, when they say peace and safety, what happens? Sudden destruction. You know, that's where the world is tonight. They all want an expanding stock market. They all want bigger and better. They're all looking for a better system. They're all looking for a utopia, but without God and without dealing with sin. In fact, I was just reading an article before I left home. Nobody uses the word sin anymore. Somebody was interviewing a, uh, a Jewish rabbi in New York City just a few weeks ago, and he says, we never use the word. Sad. That's the world's problem. But no, no, they like to ignore it, sweep it under the rug. No, there's no such thing as sin. And then we wonder why societies are falling apart. All right, so when they, those who have been left behind, say peace and safety, oh, we're going to build our own heaven on earth, God says, uh-huh. That's what you think. Sudden destruction is going to hit them. The day of the Lord, as we've been reading now for the last two half-hour programs, all up through the Old Testament, the Lord himself says there is nothing to be compared to it. The book of Revelation puts it out graphically. 
and their destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. There's not going to be any place to hide. They won't be able to hide from the forces of the Antichrist. The technology now is such that not only will they be able to know every word of your conversation, they're going to know every place that you are with global positioning. Nobody's going to be able to hide. And the scripture is so adamant on that. They shall not escape. Verse 4. What's the first word? But. Another flip side. That's not us. It's who? Them. <laughs> Am I making my point? To those that are left behind, to them, see? They shall not escape. But for us, you, brethren, Paul says, you're not in darkness that that day, the day of the Lord, shall overtake you as a thief. Why not? Because we're going to experience the day of Christ before the day of the Lord happens. All right, now let's pick up a few references, and they'll all be in Paul's epistles, with regard to this day of Christ. All right, come back. Starts at verse, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Oh, let's start at verse 4. Can you pick that up without having to change the page so we can keep it going? Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 4. Now this is Paul writing to the Gentile believers at Corinth. So in so many words, it's to us. And he says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God. See, no wrath. This is grace. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. Now you see the difference in the language already? The day of the Lord was the day of Jehovah, his Old Testament title. Paul speaks of him not as Jehovah, but as what? Jesus Christ. Oh, what a difference. Same person, but in a different role. All right. Now verse 5, that in everything spiritual, material, physical, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you become behind in no gift. Now here it comes, waiting for the coming not of the day of the Lord, but for the what? The Lord Jesus Christ. See that? We are waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, sorry, honey. Keep your hand in 1 Corinthians. The verse just comes to mind, and when they come to mind, I have to use them. I can't help that. Titus. We've used it occasionally up through the years, but oh, it's one of my favorite verses. And it's a verse I've shared on the program to use on people who come to your door and deny that Jesus Christ is God. Now, they have a way of wiggling around just about every other portion of Scripture that I've tried to use, but they can't wiggle around this one. Titus, chapter 2. Let's just start at verse 11. Titus, chapter 2, verse 11. Paul is writing. And he says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has, past tense, appeared to all men. The same grace of God teaches us that we're to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now here's the verse looking for that blessed hope, not the wrath of God. Paul never uses that term for the believer. But he said, looking for that blessed or that happy hope. And what is it? The glorious appearing of the great God. See? 
No doubt about that. That's deity as much as you can make it. We are looking for the appearing of that great God, the creator of the universe, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. One and the same. The God of creation, the God of everything, is also the Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself that he might redeem us. All right, now then, come back to 1 Corinthians 1 once again. So we're waiting for this glorious, blessed hope to become a reality, the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not his coming to the Mount of Olives in wrath and uh, trampling the wine vat of his wrath. No, we're waiting for that blessed hope that we're going to meet him in the air along with all of our loved ones. My, I used to hear a quartet sing years and years back. I haven't heard it now for a long time. That meeting in the air. Some of you older folks probably remember. Got some quartet singers in here. Have you ever sung it? Kenneth, where are you? Yeah. Do you sing it? Have you had in the past? Sure. That meeting in the air. When all the saints will suddenly be in the Lord's presence. See? All right. Verse 8. Who? the one who's coming, Jesus the Christ, shall confirm you unto the end. He's never going to let go. He's not going to lose of one of us, see, who will confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless. We're never going to stand before him shaking in our boots and wondering, are we still going to go to hell? Are we going to go to heaven? No, that's been settled. We'll never have to stand before him and say, oh, I've got all this sin. No, that's all been pushed under the blood. That's all been cleansed. And we stand before him blameless. That's what the book says. That's not what Les says. That's what the book says. That we'll stand before him blameless. And what day? The day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Not the day of the Lord for judgment, but the day of Jesus Christ, or the day of God's calling out the believers. All right, turn the pages a little bit, still in 1 Corinthians, and we come to chapter 5. And let's see, verse 5. Here we have a good example of what chapter 1 is talking about. Now the Corinthians, you want to remember when we studied the book, the Corinthians were the least spiritual, the most carnal of all of Paul's congregations. They were a carnal group of people. They were having a hard time departing from the sins of the flesh. One of their members was so despicable that Paul says his particular sin was so rotten, it was so low that even the pagan Gentiles didn't do something like that. But the man didn't lose his salvation for it. And this is what Paul is teaching, that under the grace of God, even that man will yet be under that forgiving power of the blood of Christ. And so this is what he says in verse 3, For I verily, as absent in body but present in spirit, have judged or come to a conclusion already as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver, deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. In other words, that his life would be taken rather than continue to bring reproach upon the name of Christ. And God works the same way today. When people call and say, well, so-and-so was a good child of God, he was a good Christian, and now all of a sudden he's run off with somebody else's wife and he's out there living it in the world, partying all the time, you tell me he's still saved? No, I don't think he ever was. Because when a believer does that, God either brings them back or he takes them out. He's not going to let them continue to be smirched the name of Christ. And that's what Paul is saying about this fellow. He said, even the Gentiles scoff at what that man's doing. But he's not going to lose his salvation because of it. But rather, God is going to take him out 
of his human life to spare the reproach of Christ. All right, but that's not what I intended to show you. Verse 5. To deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved, when? In the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what day of Christ is he talking about? When Christ returns to take the body of Christ out from this old planet. All right, let's go over to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. And remember all the time that all of these references are only in Paul's epistles. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. Y'all got it? As also you have acknowledged us in part that we are your rejoicing. Speaking of the fact that Paul's Preaching and teaching had brought them out of abject idolatry. That we are your rejoicing, even as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus, or the day of Christ. Well, what's he talking about? That all of these Corinthian believers are going to be united with Christ and Paul and you and I and all the church age believers when we have that meeting in the air. See? in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now let's move on over to Philippians. Go through Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Chapter 2, verse 16. Philippians, chapter 2, verse 16. In fact, let's read verse 15. That's almost too good to ignore, isn't it? Philippians chapter 2, and let's read both verse 15 and 16. That you may be, same word, blameless. That is, in the eyes of the Lord Jesus. That you may be blameless and harmless. The sons are the born ones of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now, I always have to stop there a moment. You remember when Jesus was with the Twelve, and they were probably up there north of Galilee, and the little city is still there, and I think of it every time that uh, we look to the north from Galilee, and there sits that little Jewish city on the hill, just like a gemstone up there. And I think the Lord was probably under those same circumstances when he said to the twelve, you are the what? The light of the world. You are the light of the world. You should sit like a city on a hill. But they dropped the ball. Israel reneged on that opportunity to be the light of the world. So now then, who is the light of the world? Well, we are. See, we are. That wasn't spoken to us, it was spoken to the twelve and Israel. But, see now Paul uses the same analogy. As believers in Christ, we are the light of the world. All right, now verse 16. And we're to be holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. Not the day of the Lord, not the day of judgment, the day of Christ when the church, the body of Christ, will suddenly be translated to meet the Lord in the air. And then as we saw a few programs back, so shall we ever be with the Lord. What a glorious expectancy that all of a sudden, without having to go through the throes of death and that trip to the cemetery and all that goes with it, we're suddenly going to be in that glorious estate. My, no wonder it's a blessed hope. You know, I still try to encourage people who call that they have been diagnosed with something terminal and the doctors have given six months or a year. And I just say, hey, buck up. The Lord may come before that disease gets you. And I mean that. I think we're that close. That if someone is terminal, that can still be their blessed hope. 
that the Lord will come and they won't have to go that way of the cemetery, that we will suddenly be translated and we can rejoice in that day of Christ when we meet him in the air. Well, see, those are about the only references, at least that I am aware of and can find, that Paul makes to that event because it is not judgmental. It is not something that is earth-shaking because of the uh, attending disasters and all that. It's just a sudden disappearance of the believers. All right, now then, let's go back for the next couple minutes that are left to 1 Thessalonians again, chapter 5. We're again verse 5, almost like he said in Philippians. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 5. You are the children of light. Now remember, Paul writes to the believers in Thessalonica, but he also is writing to us today. And we can take this to heart, that you are the children of light, the children of the day. We are not of the night. We as believers are not stumbling in darkness, wondering what's going to happen next. We know what's coming. And consequently, we can walk in light. We can walk completely aware of what's going on. You know, I've had this happen over and over over the years when people come into my class who have never heard any of these end time events. It's never been taught in their Sunday school or their pastor has never preached on them. And they come in and they suddenly come to a knowledge of salvation and they begin to see all these things. I'll never forget one individual in particular. He said, you know, he said, I used to read the paper every day and never associated all this with end time. But now he said, almost every newspaper I pick up, that's all I can see is everything falling in place for the end time. You can't miss it if you know that you're in the light. All right, read on. What we got? Oh, just a matter of 30 seconds. Therefore, verse 6, let us not sleep my, this is no time for believers to be dozing off. If ever there was a time the believer should be wide awake and expectant, it is today. Don't fall asleep and think, oh, well, the Lord is going to delay his coming. No, he may not. He may come before we get home tonight. He may come tomorrow. But this is how we're supposed to live, is expectantly that he may come in the next moment. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Felding Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.